Financial calculations are a big part of the ARE 5.0 exams, specifically practice management and project management. There's a lot to know. There could be two dozen different terms that might come up, but I'm a big proponent of preparing efficiently and triaging your studies. You are not going to learn every single thing for every exam, uh, and you have to be okay with that. So the key is to make sure that you are not neglecting the most important things. For financial calculations, these seven terms I'm covering today are very efficient. The financial terms are net operating revenue, direct labor, indirect labor, utilization rate, overhead rate, break-even rate, and net multiplier. What I mean by efficient is you have a high likelihood of seeing them on the exam and seeing them multiple times. So learning these terms is a great investment in that they will take you very far. Start here, get these ones down, and then if you have the time, energy, motivation, or interest, just keep getting deeper. You know, it never hurts to learn more things, but at a minimum, get these ones down uh, before you move on. So I'm briefly going to cover each term, go over a sample problem for each one as well. This video might get long, so check out the description below for timestamps for each turn and for each term. Uh, and if you can't watch this video because you don't have internet or something, there's also a link to a blog version uh, below that you can find. Let's get started. Uh, oh yeah, I'm Ben. This is Hyperfine. Stick around to the end for a shocking admission, but let's get started. Net operating revenue, or NOR. Uh, paraphrasing the definition from the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice, it is the net dollars remaining after deducting consultant fees, reimbursables, and non-direct project-related expenses. So think of it as the money you have to actually run your firm. You start with your gross revenue, all the money you have coming in, then you subtract what you have to pay to consultants, you subtract money that's reimbursement for things that you paid on behalf of your client, and you subtract things that you... Uh, are earmarked that you know you're going to have to pay to do a project that you're not going to get paid back for. So, for example, consultant fees, you get a fee of $100,000. You know consultants are going to take 30% of that. So uh, when you think about the money you have to actually run your firm, you don't have $100,000. You have $70,000. And from that $70,000, you can pay your employees, you can pay for marketing, you can rent your office, that type of thing, right? Reimbursables is the same thing. If you pay a $20,000 permit fee on behalf of your client and then they pay you back $20,000, that's a net of zero, right? So you don't get that check from the client and say, okay, now I can go pay my employees because that money was sort of just passed through. And it's the same thing with um, project-related expenses that are not reimbursable. So I'm not sure exactly what that is. Maybe mileage, uh, maybe printing, if you that's not your contract, you know, some things that basically you know you have to spend on the project um, that you're not going to get paid back for. So you start with your total revenue, you subtract your consultant fees, you subtract reimbursables, you subtract project-related expenses that you cannot get reimbursed for. Everything left is what you have to run your firm. So like I said again, like your lease or your mortgage, your marketing, your salaries for your people, equipment, um, all these things, everything you need to do to keep the lights on at the firm, that's coming out of your NOR. If you happen to get a profit loss statement um, in the case studies, you can actually look at that and you can see what's included because net operating revenue is a line item. It's line item A in a Maddox format profit loss statement. And so everything above that line item is what's included in that line item. So for a profit loss statement, it's going to say, Fees build, reimbursables build, outside consultants, and project-related expenses. Every single thing below that does not go into the NOR. It's what you, the NOR is what you have to spend on all those other things, every single thing else that you have to pay to run your firm. Let's do an example problem. So you have four projects for the third quarter with a total cost of construction of $325 million. Your design fee for each project is 8% of the cost of construction. Your consultants will receive 25% of the design fee. You will spend $500,000 marketing and promoting your firm in relation to these projects. And you will pay an average of 2% of the construction cost for permits on behalf of your clients to be reimbursed with your final invoice. What is your NOR? Okay, sample problem one. Uh, we've got four projects in the third quarter with a total cost of construction of $325 million. Our fee is 8%. The consultants re receive 25% of the design fee. 
We're going to spend $500,000 on marketing and promoting our involvement with these four projects. And we are going to pay an average of 2% of the construction cost for permits, which will be reimbursed by the client. Let's find the NOR. The first thing we've got to do is just find what our design fee is. So that's just $325 million multiplied by 8%. 0 0.08 equals $26 million. The next part is we're giving away 25% of that to our consultants. So uh, that's money that we get, you know, we get this revenue, but we don't keep all of it. 25% of that's earmarked for our consultants. So step two is figuring out what we have left after that. So we don't necessarily need to find the consultants fees. All we need to know is that we have 75% left. So 26 million multiplied by 0.75 equals $19,500,000. So then there's some more information. You will spend $500,000 marketing and promoting your firm. Marketing uh, is money that comes out of our NOR, so we don't use it to find the NOR. So this is superfluous or information that's meant to trick you. So of this $19,500,000, we're going to spend $500,000 on marketing, but it doesn't come out of our revenue before calculating NOR. And then it's the same thing for the permits. So we're going to pay 2% of this $325 million. So we're going to pay on behalf of our clients about $6.5 million in permits, but then we're just getting that right back. So we're not going to count that in revenue. We're not going to count that as project-related expenses. We're just going to ignore it for the purpose of this. So that leaves us with $19,500,000 NOR from which we can run our firm. Direct labor, this is the time in hours or dollars charged to a project, whether it is invoiced or not. Uh, and this includes the total compensation for that employee for the time they are working on that project. So salary, payroll taxes, benefits, whatever money goes to that employee, whatever the cost that employee is, if they're working on a project, it's direct labor. And we're going to see this again a couple times when we talk about indirect labor and utilization rate. Uh, and so you might get tricked or confused about whether the time gets billed or whether it's overtime or different things. But it's pretty simple. As long as you're working on a project and it's billed to a project, it is direct labor. So you personally encounter direct labor when you complete your time tracking sheets for a project, right? So when an architecture firm pays employees to design or produce construction documents, or schematic design or whatever it is you're doing for a specific job, those are all counted as direct costs to the firm. Let's do a sample problem. Employee A costs your company $75 an hour, not including 7.65% payroll taxes. They worked 500 hours on billable work, only 450 of which was actually invoiced to the client, and 250 hours of non-related project work. What is the direct labor cost for employee A Round up to the nearest hundred dollars. Okay, for the direct labor, employee A costs your company seventy-five dollars per hour, not including seven point six five percent payroll tax. They worked five hundred hours of billable work, only four hundred fifty of which was actually invoiced to the client and 250 hours of non-project related expenses. What is the direct labor cost of employee A round up to the nearest $100? So the first thing we've got to do is understand that they worked 500 hours on a project, whether or not the company bills the entire time is a different issue. And the thing to keep in mind is, if that doesn't make sense to you, is that all of these metrics we're gonna talk about are slightly imperfect. They all have things that don't quite make sense or don't truly capture the true picture of what's going on. So just keep in mind, if you're talking about direct labor, utilization rate, it's just time that's spent on a project, whether you get paid for it or not. So the first thing we gotta do is 500 multiplied by 75, 500 hours times 75 per hour equals 37,500. Payroll tax is included in direct labor. We're talking about the total cost of the employee, so it's their salary, it's their benefits, it's payroll tax, all that stuff goes into it. So step two is we need to find what that tax is. And we don't actually have to find the tax, we just have to add it. So the quickest way to do that is 37,500 multiplied by 1.0765, and that works out to 40,000, 
368.75, and I'm not doing that in my head. I've got it over here that you can't see. And we said round up to the nearest hundreds of dollars. So the direct labor expense for this employee is $40,400. Indirect labor, as you might have guessed, is time spent not working on projects, time or dollars not spent working on projects. So this pretty much includes 100% of the time of support staff, the CFO, maintenance workers, admin staff, people who never do architecture, who 100% uh, of their time is basically indirect labor, and architects when they're doing stuff that is not drawing buildings. So if you're in training, if you happen to also like run the firm's website or do marketing or whatever it is you do when you're not doing architecture, not working for a specific project, that is indirect labor. And again, with direct labor and indirect labor, you might see these on the exam as an hours, so like 40 hours a week or 30 hours a week, or you might see it in terms of how much it costs the, the firm. So $2,000 worth of salary, right? So it's the same thing. These are basically ratios of, you know, or an accounting of time or dollars spent working on projects versus not on projects. A firm employs administrative staff who work an average of 20 hours per week and are paid an hourly rate of $25. Calculate the total monthly indirect labor costs of the firm. Assume there are four weeks in a month. Okay, this one's meant to be easy. Um, the firm employs administrative staff work an average of 20 hours per week. They're paid $25 an hour and assume there are four weeks in the month. What is the indirect labor cost for this employee? So first thing we do is 20 hours per week multiplied by $25 per hour. Make sure to cancel out your units and you get whatever that is, $500 per week. Step two, just multiply by the weeks. So $500 per week multiplied by four weeks per month cross out the weeks, and the direct labor cost for this employee is $2,000 for the month. Utilization rate. Paraphrasing the Architect Handbook of Professional Practice definition, it is the ratio of direct hours charged to projects to the total hours reported. This can also be calculated as the ratio of direct salary expenses to the total salary expense. Uh, if I had to choose one thing that's most important, I'd say it's utilization rate. You know, we had to cover indirect and direct labor first, so you had a better understanding of it. But this and net operating revenue are probably the two most important ones if you're going to just choose two out of this list. Uh, and basically, it measures the firm's efficiency by assessing the percentage of billable hours worked compared to the total available hours. Now, I know the definitions are pretty boring. This one is also very simple. You basically take how much time you were working on a project, you divide it by how much time there was altogether. So if you were working on a project for 30 hours out of a 40 hour work week, your utilization rate is 0.75 or 75%. Keep in mind on the exam, you might see this as hours, you might see it as dollars. So a, you know, an employee who earned $100,000 a year and they build $60,000 to clients would have a utilization rate of 60 or 60%, 60 right, of 0.60. Now keep in mind, all these metrics we're talking about are slightly imperfect. So utilization rate, direct labor, it only counts the time that you are actually accounting towards a project. It doesn't tell you really how efficient you are during that time. So if you work 20 hours on a project out of a 40 hour work week, you say, okay, I've got a utilization rate of 50%. But if you spent an entire day out of that project, um, you know, watching Hyperfine on YouTube and studying for your ARE, you're not actually being efficient, you're not getting work done, but that is sort of unknown to utilization rate. As long as it's a project um, that your time is going to, it counts as direct labor, it counts as increasing your utilization rate. And these imperfections in all of these formulas and all these calculations is an opportunity for NCARB to trick you or throw you for a loop on the exam and make you think things matter when they actually don't.
Uh, for example, let's say you have a contract that's hourly not to exceed 100 hours and you work 120 hours on that contract. You would think, okay, well that extra 20 hours we can't bill, that doesn't count, that's not direct labor, that's not utilization rate. And it doesn't matter if you're getting paid for it or not, it doesn't matter if you're actually doing your work or not, as long as your time is attributed to a project, it's direct labor, and it counts towards your utilization rate. Employee A worked 32 hours on a project, six hours on admin tasks, and spent two hours studying for the ARE. Of the 32 hours on a project, the employee had Revit open on one monitor and was actually reading Hyperfine blog for four hours and another 20 minutes watching my backstory on Bryn Young's podcast. Employee B worked 24 hours on a project, including eight hours of time the client will not be billed for. They also took two days off for PTO to pass practice management. Congratulations. Assuming a 40-hour work week, what was the combined, what was the combined utilization rate for these two employees? Utilization rate. This one is super important. Definitely make sure you understand this concept when you go into your exams. So employee A worked 32 hours on a project. They worked six hours admin and spent two hours during the week studying for the ARE. Of those 32 hours when they were supposed to be working, they were working on one screen and reading Hyperfine blog for four hours on the other monitor and another 20 minutes listening to Bryn Young's podcast. Um, employee B worked 24 hours on projects. Eight of those were not invoiced, and then six hours, or I'm sorry, 16 hours of PTO. So what is the utilization rate of these two employees over a 40-hour work week? So all we have to do is find the hours they were working on projects and divide it by the total time. And like I said before, all of these metrics are slightly imperfect. So this 32 hours, the entire thing counts, even though four hours, they were just, you know, almost four and a half hours, they weren't actually doing work, even though they said they were doing work. And this person, they have 24 hours of um, direct labor or project time, even though the firm, for whatever reason, may not invoice eight of those hours, that 24 hours, the entire thing still counts as being part of a project. It's still direct labor. And this one is so easy that I messed up the math, but I didn't want to have to rewrite all that stuff. So all we've got to do is add 32 and 24 and divide by the total number of hours in the week. So 32 plus 24 equals 56. And there's 80 hours in this work week, right? This person works 40 and this person works 40. So we could have done 32 divided by 40 plus 24 divided by 40. I'm just doing 56 divided by 80 because I think it's faster. And that works out to 70% utilization rate. Overhead rate, it is the ratio of indirect expenses to total direct labor. Of all the terms we're talking about today, this one is probably the most intuitive sense of what it's about. Um, and I have a whole separate post about calculating overhead rate and break-even rate. I'll leave the link in the description below. But it's good to understand the math behind it and how you actually calculate it so you understand what is actually going on here. So more simply put, it is the cost of doing business. For every dollar you pay your employees, how much do you have to pay to just keep the lights on? So. Per the definition, it is the ratio of indirect expenses to total direct labor. So indirect expenses includes all the indirect labor, so all the time or salary you're paying for the CFO or admin staff or architects who are not doing projects, all that indirect labor, plus indirect expenses, basically all the expenses that are not attributed to a project, which includes things like your rent or your lease, your mortgage or software licenses, or computers, or utilities, or insurance, or marketing, right? All the things that you have to pay um, to run a firm that don't get directly billed to a project. All that stuff is indirect. And so you take that entire thing, you divide it by your total direct labor. It's going to be a dollar value this time. And you'll get some type of unitless ratio, like 1.3, or 1.4, 1.5, or 2.0, that type of thing, right? A target overhead rate is between 1.3, 1.5. Obviously, bigger firms are going to have more overhead. You know, if you have admin staff, you're going to have more overhead than a small firm that just everyone's architects and they just sort of do all kinds of, you know, they sort of wear many hats in the in the in the firm. So, for example, let's say your firm has an overhead rate of 1.5, and you your direct labor cost per year is a hundred thousand dollars. That means the firm is also paying a hundred fifty thousand dollars. Um, for all the stuff I mentioned before, for the time that you're not working on projects, for the rent, for the software, for the marketing, for the electricity bill, for the plumbing bill, all that kind of stuff, 
all that overhead uh, is $150,000 compared with the $100,000 just of labor that you're doing on projects. A firm has total overhead costs of $500,000 and total direct labor costs of $375,000. Calculate the overhead rate. Overhead rate, this one's also meant to be pretty easy. So you've got overhead costs of $500,000. And all we're going to do is divide that by the total direct labor costs of $375,000. And you get 1.333. Uh, and so what this means is basically for every dollar that you pay your employees, you have $1.33 of overhead costs. And we're going to get into how that affects what you bill your client next when we talk about uh, break-even rate and profit. Break-even rate is the overhead rate plus the unit cost of 1.00 for an hour of salary. So again, another one that maybe is somewhat intuitive, but the break-even rate is the billing rate at which the firm's revenue covers all its expenses, resulting in neither a profit nor a loss. It's the break-even point. So it considers both direct and indirect costs to determine the minimum billing rate required to break even. Uh, and so again, it's something you probably understand, but it's important to understand the math, important to know the math of how you get there so you can solve this problem if you see it on the exam. So let's use our example from last time. Let's say your firm has an overhead rate of 1.5 and you cost um, $100 an hour for, uh, for your labor. So if you spend one hour working on a project, the cost of the firm is $150 just to keep the lights on, and then they've got to pay you for that one hour of time. They've got to pay your salary, your taxes, your benefits, your pay time off, all that kind of stuff, right? So you take the overhead rate of 1.5, and you add in a 1.0, which is just a multiplier of your hours, and you get 2.5. So that means they have to bill the client $250 an hour for one hour of your time just to break even. So we're not even earning any money yet, but on the other side, we're not losing money either, right? You're just breaking even. So once you know the break even rate, you can then figure out what you need to actually bill a client to earn a profit. Um, and this one is one that is often done incorrectly, and I've actually seen it done incorrectly on the NCARB forum by an NCARB moderator. All I can say about that is it's frustrating and disappointing, but you can't control what other people are doing. The more times you are right, uh, then not the better off. So if you want to figure out what the profit margin is, you divide by the inverse. So if you want to make a 25% profit, you divide by 0.75. So we have our $250 per hour break even rate. We divide that by 0.75. We end up with $333.33. Um, I'm not doing this in my head. I have it all down here. So the to make a 25% profit, we have to bill this employee's time at $333 an hour. And you can check your work by subtracting the break even rate and working backwards. So let's say you bill the client $333. $250 of that is just break even. So 333 minus 250, you're left with 83. 83 divided by 333 is 25%. Your firm has an overhead rate of 1.55. You cost the firm $95 per hour. What is the break even rate for one hour of your time? To achieve a 20% profit, what does the firm need to bill clients for your time? Round up to the nearest whole dollar. Okay, your firm has an overhead rate of 1.55, and you cost the firm $95 per hour. What is the break-even rate for one hour of your time, and what does the firm have to bill you at if they want to achieve a 20% profit? So the first thing we do is start with overhead rate, and to get the break-even rate, we add one, we add a multiplier of 1.0. So 1.55 plus 1.00 equals 2.55. So to find the break-even cost of your time, we take 2.55 multiplied by $95 per hour, and we get uh, $242.25. $242 and the way that's broken down is 
uh, it's $147.25 of overhead plus 95. So this 1.55 multiplied the overhead rate multiplied by the cost of view is $147.25. That's overhead. That's what it costs just to keep the lights on in the business before you even get paid. Then they have to pay you for that hour. So that's why you add that that $95. That's why you add that 1.00. So the break-even rate for you is $242.25. Then if you want a 20% profit margin, you divide by the inverse percentage. So what I mean is you take 242.25, you divide by 0 0.8, right? So you divide by 80% and you end up with 302 point eight one two five and we said we're gonna round up to the nearest dollar so your rate is three hundred three dollars per hour if you then want to check the math on that because we want to this is what the client gets billed twenty percent of that is profit the other the rest of it goes to overhead and going to actually paying you so to check your math on it what we do is we take three oh three and we subtract 242.25, right? That's the break even amount. And we're left with $60.75. You take 60.75, you divide that by 303, which is the price we're saying to the client, and you get something like 79.95, just because you know we rounded up a little bit there, but you check your math, and if you do it right, that should work out to 80% or very, very close to it if you've done any rounding. Net multiplier. Thank goodness we saved the easiest one for last. This is the ratio of net operating revenue to total direct labor. It indicates the return on every dollar of direct labor. So if you don't want to do any of these other calculations, I guess you got to start with NOR, but if you just want a real quick and dirty and probably imperfect understanding of the uh, financial status of a firm, you basically take your net operating revenue and you divide it by the total cost you're spending on direct labor. And that's going to be a number, a unitless number, like 3.2 or 2.5 or something. And what that's saying is basically for every dollar you are spending on direct labor, how much revenue are you getting in? So if the number is 3.0, you spend $1 on direct labor, that should result in $3 coming into the firm. So if the net multiplier is greater than the break-even rate, you're going to be profitable. Maybe not as much as you want, but you're going to be making money, right? So if the break-even rate is 2.5, that's saying for every $100 we spend on direct labor, it costs us 250 total dollars. And if your net multiplier is 3.0, that means for every $100 you spend on direct labor, you're bringing in $300. So you're getting that $50 profit for every hour. And maybe that's the firm's goals, maybe it's not, but as long as your net multiplier is more than the break-even rate, you are going to be profitable. A firm has net revenue of $800,000 and direct labor costs of $250,000. Calculate the net multiplier for this firm. A net multiplier, this one is meant to be somewhat easy. And if you're not trying to figure out utilization rate or a lot of these other factors, you just want to say, are we making money for each employee? You take your net operating revenue given to you here is $800,000. You divide it by your direct labor costs. So $800,000 divided by $250,000 equals 3.2. And what's that saying? What that's saying is that for every dollar you spend on direct labor on salary, you are bringing in $3.2. And if that happens to be above your break-even rate, then you're making money and maybe not the profit margin you want, but as long as that is above your break-even rate, then you're going to be making money. If you're still here, thanks for sticking around. I hope this was helpful. I'm Ben. This is Hyperfine. Um, Check out hyperfinearchitecture.com. I've got tons of blogs, free resources, YouTube videos. I've got some paid ARE 5.0 study material, including an entire financial formulas course that's within my PCM PJM course. 
It includes more in-depth examples of stuff like this, more videos, more calculations, all that stuff to help get you prepared for the exams and then really for professional practice beyond the exams. Thanks for watching. That intro was a lie. I recorded it after I did all this other work. I knew exactly how long this video was going to be. I knew it was going to be long. You can't believe anything you see on the internet.